Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're really excited to have everybody here tonight. Uh, tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Jimmy Briggs. Jimmy's a, an award-winning journalist uh, who's done a lot of work in the area of human rights, uh, and he's going to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, but I also want to thank the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which is one of our partners in co-sponsoring tonight's event. So please join me in welcoming Jimmy. <clears throat> oh, the mic's on now. Um, first of all, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to tonight's forum. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here this evening. I was recalling with Carrie, I'd been here last, maybe four years ago, to do a program on hip hop and social change. So it's nice to come back in this setting and discuss an issue which is very close to my heart, child soldiers. I'd like to introduce my colleagues and fellow panelists. To my immediate left is Jocelyn Kelly, who is the director of Harvard Humanitarian Initiative's Women in War Program. She's also a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she's, she, prior to joining Harvard Humanitarian Initiatives, she worked with um, Katrina, uh, post-Katrina with FEMA, and she's also the co-author of, of a study from DRC, which we'll discuss this evening. To her left is Ishmael Bea, best-selling author of the book A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Boy Soldier. His next book is a novel being, coming out in January of next year, The Radiance of Tomorrow. And we'll talk more about Ishmael and his background. To his left is Leila Zarugi, who is now the UN Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. Um, a me past member of Algeria's government, and a longtime expert in human rights and issues of justice. So, I mean, the further bios or deeper bios are in the programs that you all have, so I want to keep them brief and start the conversation off right away. Uh, Leila, I'll start with you. Why are we talking about the issue of, of child soldiers now? What, what makes it relevant at this moment in time? Why? Because we don't want any more Children, child soldier, in, in, in uh, at least uh, uh, as a uh, human, uh, the, the international uh, understanding is we don't want child soldier. That's why we are why we are talking about child soldier. Of course, we are also talking about child soldier because all of us are now aware what is happening because of the technology, because in every house image arrives. We don't hear about what is happening after the war finish. We are aware while it is happening. So what is happening in, uh, in today's war, all the violence, children are recruited. It's not in one place. It's not in one country. In my mandate, we have 22 conflict situations where children are recruited. They are bearing the, 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 the plight of, of the war. They are abused. and. They are sexually abused and tortured and all, all the other vi violations. So children, uh, and it's in Africa, it's in Asia, it's in Latin America, it's everywhere where you have a conflict. So that, that's why we are talking about, we would like that this stop, we would like that people that can make a difference everywhere, and everyone can make a difference, because this is not something that is about few people or few countries. We are all, we have a responsibility, and we uh, try to let people understand that, first of all, it's their responsibility to stop this, government, international community, UN, and also we would like to see uh, uh, partners, we would like to see community, civil society, uh, taking this into consideration, because we have, no, it's not about 100 or two, it's thousands of children that are used in conflict, that are affected by conflict, and it's every year the UN release thousands, but we still have thousands in every conflict. We have children recruited in Syria, in Colombia, in, of course, DRC, in uh, Mali, in every setting where you have a conflict. Thank you, Leila. Jocelyn, we're gonna learn more about a study which she co-authored, um, co-produced, we came back with empty hands, which focuses on, on the DRC. How did you come to this work? Um, 
Well, I want to say first what an incredible honor it is to be here with this panel and especially to be with my co-presenters. Um, I would say that this project actually came about through a somewhat unexpected route. I started working in DRC in 2007, and at that time I was interested in the conflict and in those fighting in it, but I didn't have a focus specifically on children. The work did bring me to interview adult rebel soldiers to better understand the violence they used in the conflict and why it occurred. And through these conversations, it became clear that the soldiers had been involved in conflict long before I spoke to them and often became involved as children. Many of the soldiers I talked to had been coerced or abducted into armed groups at a very young age, but they actually chose to stay and to fight in order to avenge the terrible violence that they had witnessed against their families and against their communities. In, I think, what is one of the grandest tragedies of war, many of these same soldiers then became perpetrators of the exact same abuses that had driven them to protect their communities in the first place. So I think what is most striking of all is that many of the individuals I spoke with had actually tried to leave armed groups, not once, but multiple times. The men I talked to described the cyclical nature of the conflict. Without a foundation of peace and stability, demobiliz demobilization efforts remained this revolving door for combatants. They tried to become civilians, they failed, and then they returned again to fighting. And I began to wonder, what is it about conflict that is so sticky and pulls people back in time and time again? And what is it about demobilization that's so difficult? So um, we wanted to look at soldiers' experiences with demobilization. And in order to do this, we partnered with um, a really wonderful NGO called the Eastern Congo Initiative that looks at innovative programming both for former child soldiers and for those at risk of recruitment. And um, we began talking about a project that would tell the story of child soldiering and demobilization from the perspective and with the words of those affected by it, including child soldiers, communities, and families. And the overarching goal is to create an evidence base of things that work and do not work from the past in order to inform future programming. So in order to undertake a project that truly used the words of the communities themselves, we used an approach called participatory action research. That allows grassroots organizations to collaboratively design and be a part of the research process from beginning to end in what we hope is kind of an agent for change type model. So what we did was offered communities techniques and they chose the ones that they wanted to use. And so they did choose some very traditional public health research techniques that you guys are probably all familiar with and those include focus groups and interviews. But the communities also chose pretty remarkable visual methodologies as well. So they took photos, created photo essays, and um, also uh, created these incredible life-size drawings where a group collaboratively literally illustrates the effect of conflict on the human body. And this is a technique we call body mapping, and you can see that image here. So, yeah, I think maybe I'll end there. Okay. Will we show the video after the next? Okay, got it. Um, Ishmael, your book, your memoir about your experiences as, as a child soldier in Sierra Leone, you were conscripted at 13, fought as a child soldier for almost three years, later documented that, that journey in your memoir in 2007. In the past six years, since the emergence of your book and your emergence as an, an ambassador, a spokesperson into the lives of child soldiers globally, what changes have you seen? What, what progress have you seen in the past six years since your book first came out? Um, well, I do work for uh, UNICEF, and in that capacity, I travel to a lot of places that uh, post-conflict uh, countries are ongoing. Sometimes they're not sure where they are. Um, and in places where children carry guns and try to uh, participate in the negotiations of their release and look at DDR programs. Uh, but my initial, um, uh, you know, sort of arrival at the, the international level on this issue really started in 1996, which was following the study that Grasse Marshall had done on the impact of armed conflict on children around the world. And that study really what, what, was what brought the issue to the international agenda, to the Security Council, 
that then led to the creation of the office that uh, Lila now leads and uh, leads and, and a, a few other things. Throughout those years, a lot of things have happened. Um, international legal standards, various re UN resolutions, uh, regional charters, such as the African Charter on the Welfare of the Child, the Cape Town Principles, uh, even in Latin America, various things have happened. So uh, there are so many resolutions and so many international legal standards, and a lot has been done on paper about what can be done and how we can address the issue. But where the problem lies, from my uh, 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 look at the issue and going to on the ground where these things, is the implementation mm -hmm. of some of these things. Mm -hmm. We do have wonderful uh, and amazing documentation of what to do, how to do it, mm -hmm. how to hold people accountable, and various governments have signed it. Now, when it comes to children, no government will publicly say we're not interested. They will say, yes, we are. They will sign countless documents, but then they will go back and sit down, and they won't do anything. So that's where the problem is. So even when you go to, and it, it, oftentimes even when they sign these things, they don't think or they don't even have the capacity to implement some of them. So and we expect them to do something. So we, if we go to a particular place, for example, over the last, last year and this year, I spent a lot of time in Central African Republic where they've signed a lot of things, but you go there and they have not even built within their own government the juvenile justice standards that are required to deal with children. In certain places, children do not have birth certificate. How do you determine what age they are? When they come, they have not put anything in place to do any of these things, so th everything becomes difficult. And even in addition, you meet certain government officials in some of these countries that do not even know what it is that they have signed on to. They have not even read it, so they don't know, so you have to actually teach them <laughs> what, what it is that the previous government before them had signed on to, and then try to begin building capacity, if possible, uh, to work on this issue. So uh, that's what I've seen is that, yes, uh, there's more work that needs to be done for implementation and how we actually uh, can move from the paper to other things. But with that being said, you know, in terms of the International Criminal Court, there have been a few cases mm -hmm. that I've come across to send a message out, for example, the Lubanga case um, and, and Charles Taylor recently, even though the sentencing was not uh, satisfactory to a lot of people, at least something happened. You know, so you have those things that have been done. Yeah. Mm. Leela, how, how, in your capacity, well, first, a, t a two part question. Can you detail what areas of focus rest under your mandate as special representative? And also, the other part of the question is how do we move from the beautiful language on paper, the beautiful speeches at the UN, at the, at the annual General Assembly about children and war? and child soldiers, how do we move from that beautiful language to, actual, to real implementation on the ground? I think that the fact that we have a mandate at the international level with the Special Representative Secretary General that report to the General Assembly, to the Human Rights Council, and to the Security Council, that the Security Council in 1999 consider after the Grassamasho report, after we have, that this is a peace and security issue, that you have a list that identify the perpetrators. And we have two annexes in every year report to the Security Council with 55 parties to conflict, with governments and non-state actors that are listed. This, of course, and I understand the frustration of uh, uh, Ishmael, but I spent four years in DRC. And four years in DRC, from when I arrived in 2008 and when I left in 2012, the fact that this mechanism exists, that people could be identified individually, that you say you, commander, the ICC already uh, sentenced, uh, uh, at the time it was the trial for, for um, uh, Lubanga, and we, and we were in German Katanga, and we were pushing for the arrest of Bosco, and it was done. So I think that this is not nothing. Because that means that as a victim, you are legitimized. You have people that are bringing your voice to the international community, saying what is happening to you is wrong. And even if these people are sometimes not aware of what we are doing, and I, I, I understand the frustration, I saw it myself. But in my opinion, we are now 
in a, in a context that is really different from 20 years ago when this mandate was discussed and at the end established. Because we have 55 uh, parties, we have only eight government that are recruiting children that are on the list. This is out of 193 government, you have only eight. And they already signed an action plan with the Security Council, with, with us. And, and we are in the process of implementing, and we have two, we are pushing them also to join the eight. So this is a progress in itself. Then you have to build the response inside every country. What you are saying in protracted conflict, in area where you have protracted conflict that are for years, you have to address the root causes. You have to build the institutional national response that ensures sustainability of protection and accountability. So this, of course, is linked of the level and capacity of, a, of the level existing institution. And then you have other causes that you need to address. So it's a long way, but I think that we are doing the right thing. And if today, here, we are talking about reintegration, and we are realizing how complex the reintegration it is. If we could not release children and try to reintegrate them, would never we brought this issue here. We are releasing children, but we still have problem because we don't have the capacity to ensure that when they are reintegrated, they are, it's done in the proper way. And when we are uh, uh, reintegrating them, we already have a very, uh, an assessment to ensure they will not be recruited, they will not be stigmatized. All this is true, and I'm not saying things are, are perfect. I'm the first one frustrated every day I wake up, and every day I receive a report on still children recruited. But we have to, we can, we are doing, we can do more, and all of you, you can help us in making it better and more efficient and effective on the ground. Thank you, Leila. J Jocelyn, from your research in, in the Congo and, the, and the, the launch of the report we'll hear about tonight, we came back with empty hands. What were some of the, the, the key findings that you, you think we can learn about the DDR process? And you'll, you'll tell us what that means. Yeah. But also uh, about how best to care for returning child soldiers, male and female. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Jimmy. And I think what you just spoke to is one of the most um, important aspects of our report. Um, I know it probably seems obvious to all of you that both boys and girls are vulnerable to being recruited into armed groups. However, the truth is that we still don't know exactly how that occurs. And this is probably one of the first projects that has deeply looked into um, the experiences of both boys and girls and men and women. And if I could, I think Leila mentioned the importance of bringing the voices of communities into the dialogue. And so I might ask if, um, to, for your indulgence, to show you a video that really speaks with the voices and the images that come straight from DRC as part of the launch of this report related to the project that we've titled, We Came Back with Empty Hands. So if I, if I could, I'll just play you a short video that has some of the images and photos and drawings from the communities that we worked with.
when we got the ability to come back, we came back with empty hands. We came back in the village just like little children. To leave the army was not easy. It was just through determination. taken by former child soldiers and other people involved in the project and we did a very rigorous kind of ethical research training and got consent to show these images from the communities who are affected by this issue and they felt very strongly that they wanted to share this with the international and national community and to have you see these images and it, actually a few photographers did opt out and said you know would prefer to keep this as a private narrative for ourselves and those images are actually not on the website and um, not shown to you today and was used more as a, like an internal trauma processing. So um, I would really encourage you to browse all of these remarkable kind of visual data on the website wecamebach.org. And um, I'd like to summarize for you again, you know, through the voices of the communities affected, some of the findings that we had from the report. So not only using photos and body maps, but very traditional public health techniques with interviews and focus groups, we found that um, participants in the research said boys and girls were actually almost equally at risk for becoming a part of armed groups. And this really does challenge those traditional assumptions that this isn't an issue, that this is not an issue that affects girls, as you were mentioning, Jimmy. Um, not surprisingly, former child soldiers described their time in armed groups as one characterized by deep physical misery, near starvation, and abuse not only by enemy combatants, but also by those within the group that they were a part of. So um, a female former combatant um, showed the photo you saw before that was um, poetic, kind of noting how she interacted with um, dead bodies and the whole, uh, the photo that you saw of the whole became a metaphor for much that she had been through. Girls in particular faced a double burden of being both child soldiers and sex slaves and described having pregnancies resulting from rape as well as a host of other reproductive health issues. Here, um, the woman in the photo says, I'm coming out of the garden and I meet the inter Hamway, which is one of the rebel groups. And they raped me on the road and then they tied me up and carried me in my hoe that I used for cultivating. And this woman um, actually used a very striking and poetic device where she had this red scarf that you see at her feet there. And she used it in every photo as um, a metaphor or symbol of the sexual violence that she had been exposed to. So we see these kind of remarkable um, symbolism arising in the photo essays. Once children left armed groups, they um, described widely varying exposure to reintegration programming, or sometimes it's as it's known, DDR, which is disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programming. So this suggests that efforts not only differed greatly throughout the wide geographic region that we looked at, but that within communities, programs were very, very unevenly implemented. A defining issue that the child soldiers struggled with was um, the mental health consequences of what they'd been through. And this was um, a problem recognized by everyone, including family and community, as well as individuals. We see here an image that is an excerpt from one of the body maps, and it's um, a, described as the hard hearts. And this was some, a phrase we heard in every kind of methodology that we undertook. So in order to depict this, the um, Participants in the body mapping exercise drew X's over the heart, and um, inside of it are a rock and a knife to show how you must become inured and numbed to the experiences that you faced. Um, children also talked about how once they returned to communities, they faced widespread discrimination and mistrust. However, those who did accept them and stand up for them served as these incredibly powerful change agents within communities to advocate for reintegrating child soldiers into civilian life. Here we see an image taken by a young man, or by a young woman, I'm sorry, who said, homecoming, some of my siblings are happy with my coming, but one of them rejected me. And we often see this very mixed picture of some people are accepting while others are still um, very discriminatory and reject um, 
child soldiers. And then finally, participants talked about the importance of education and jobs to create a lasting sense of belonging in society. And this is not only a practical intervention for income, but it addresses mental health issues as well because it gives people a functional role that lends a sense of dignity and agency and social belonging to those people trying to find a life other than that as a soldier. And so you see a picture here of um, a young woman who's undertaking training to become a seamstress or a tailor, and this is something she was very proud of and took, took many photos of. Thank you, Jocelyn. Leila, just, just so we're, we're clear, I'm gonna hit pause for a moment so we can make it plain for everyone here who might not be familiar. Who, when, we talk, when we say child soldiers, who are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about Af only Africans? Are we talking about African boys? You know, from my experience when I was a journalist writing about this population of young people, more often than not, the assumption was when I said child soldier, that I was talking about African boys. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the minds of most people, even now when you say child soldier, I would imagine they conjure the image of Ishmael. Like mm -hmm. that's what they see. Um, I mean, what do we know? Are the numbers growing? Are they decreasing? Um, is it just Africa? Is it global? Um, is, it, is it a new phenomenon for the 20th century? I mean, what you, what's the picture that we're, we're facing here? I always say when we talk about a child soldier, the image that comes to your mind is a child in the African jungle with mm. an ake long, taller than himself. Yes. This is an image that is true, that is from the past and from the present, but it's not the only image. Ch child soldier, I think, have always exist. Mm. I think in every conflict that humankind experienced in every era, children were used and are still used. Not only, of course, in Africa, because we have conflict in Africa. When we talk about conflict, I have 22 situations of conflict. Ten of them are in Africa. Yeah. Eight are in the Arab world. Six are in, in, in Asia. Mm. So that's, that, and, and we have still Colombia uh, in Latin America. So this is a reality that affects children when you have war. And the last example, the very interesting example, is Syria. We have never, ever children recruited and used in conflict in Syria before the uh, last, uh, situ before 2011. Yeah. Now they are part of the scene, they are recruited, they are used, they are killed, they are maimed, they are detained, they are tortured, they are used as a human shield, everything is there. So that's an example. If we go to Afghanistan, child soldier, if you go to uh, 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 Iraq, if you go to Thailand, if you, every place where you have a conflict, armed groups, particularly armed groups, yeah. use children. Mm -hmm. So this is an image of the past, but it is also an image of today. So what is different? Why today, mm -hmm. as I said from the beginning, because today, first of all, you remember that my mandate was created after Grasa Machel. But what, why Grasa Machel came to the scene? Because Remember the 90s, the fall of Berlin mm -hmm. Wall, the, the consequences of all civil war in every place, including in Rwanda, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, but also in Europe. And all these, these things let people, and also at the same time you have the technology. In the past, you see the television, if you are not American, if you are myself in Algeria or someone, like uh, Ishmael in, in, in Uganda, if you have t television at home, it, might, it is controlled by state. So it's the belligerent who bring you the image. But now with the satellite, with, you, with, with, with internet, with everything, so the image came home and everyone is aware. And, everyone, and even those who are affected realize that their government are ratifying, as, as Ishmael said, mm -hmm. uh, a treaty they have uh, uh, they, they, they commit, but they don't implement. So all this make it something important. And also because of that, the General Assembly decided to create the mandate. Ask Grasa Machel to prepare a report. 1994, it was all these wars. And then 1996, it was established. It was a thematic mandate to the General Assembly. 
1999, the Security Council said, this is a, a peace and security issue. I would like to be involved. I need a report on that. So this is because of all of us, we are aware, all of us are putting in a corner those who are doing that. Mm -hmm. Because we have now an ICC. So a government has either to take action or maybe we have the command responsibility that never exists in the past. So all this make it different, but still today you have children that are affected in the worst way. I was reading a, a report that will come out uh, uh, in, in, in maybe a few weeks and I, I could not sleep night because of what all what children are experiencing. It's not just soldiers. You are talking about the stigmatization in their community. Why? Because some very vicious armed forces or armed groups force the children to go to their community to rape in public, to kill in public, to cut the link with the community. And then they cannot return. Sometimes children return to a community where they were with an enemy combatant because they are working they are, were recruited by the enemy so all this is happening but as i said it's not only africa thank you leila i'm going to open it up for questions from the audience but first i want to come back to you ishmael um i'm always happy to see ishmael I, I first we first met when you were still at oberlin over 10 years ago and you hadn't even read the book yet so I, I, in some ways i, I feel like i've had a, the, the blessing of seeing a big part of your journey is even before the book was, was published. But I, I know you want to say something, but I want to ask you a question. And this is something I, we've talked about in the past, and it's something I grappled with a lot when I was a journalist, writing about child soldiers going to these different countries, is, for lack of a better phrase, how, how do we sell this? How do we pitch it? Because I can remember when I was a journalist, you know, when my book came out, then your book came out, you know, child soldiers were seen in movies like Blood Diamond and Lord of War, it seemed like we were at a tipping point in terms of public awareness about the issue and sensitivity to it. And then there was a lull. And I don't know about you, maybe all of you on the panel have had this, this said to you before, and I know Ishmael has. I mean, people, especially those with a sensitive heart, will, sh will, will express compassion or empathy for the plight of child soldiers, you know, especially when they hear, you know, often the two graphic details of the experiences that individual soldiers go through, including yourself. But then to your point earlier, there's, there's no follow-up, there's no, there's no action. How, what, do you say, what do you say to convey the relevance of this issue, not just at the UN or to international NGOs whose reason for being is focusing on war affected children, what do you say to everyday folks you know, these, these students and professors and, and faculty here, what do you say to them in re regards to child soldiers that, that makes, drives from the point that the life of a child soldier in Uganda or Eastern DRC or Myanmar or Syria or Colombia, kids who are fighting right now at this moment, that, that, that those experiences matter in our lives here? Um, well, <laughs> there is, um there's a simple answer, which is that, you know, it's a cliche to some people, but wherever these children are, they are going to be the leaders of their various nations at some point. So if we don't do anything about them, uh, they are going to grow up in an environment where they don't have the necessary foundations and, and, and the opportunity to have, to form the right moral and ethical standards that actually create a peaceful world, mm -hmm. if you will. And so, when they become adults, we're going to have a bigger issue. Um, and it's a security issue, that's how we've tried to phrase it. Uh, oftentimes, governments do not want to act, except when we phrase it in that context. Let's take terrorism, for example. Even children are being recruited into terrorism. That w this is an, something that nobody saw coming before. Mm -hmm. We have a few US soldiers who have been shot in various theaters of conflict because of children using weapons. Some of them were not aware of the fact that children were carrying weapons. You know. So I did some workshop at the Quantico, in, uh, uh, in Quantico, in Virginia, about educating. So th there are different things. So simply it's a security issue. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, these young people are going to, <laughs> if they choose violence as the only option, and that's all they know, 
this is how they're going to run the rest of their lives. And hence, this is how they would run their societies and what you would. Now, I want to come back to what had been mentioned before. The idea, two things. First, the idea of what a child soldier is, and then uh, the, the demobilization and reintegration programs. So, so very quickly to, to say a few things about it. The idea of a child soldier, the image that has been fossilized in the mindset of the international community is the boy with the AK-47. Yes. And everybody has come to believe that strongly that you, it, it's very hard to talk to people about anything else. Um, what people don't know is that the term refers to children that are not necessarily just carrying weapons, but children who have been uh, carrying loads, who are carrying ammunition, who are forced to, to work for soldiers. It also relates to, to, to girls who also carry the weapons but they're sexually abused. And actually when we go to do negotiations wherever, Colombia, uh, you know, Eastern Congo, or uh, it's in Central Africa, or wherever, uh, the commanders do not release the girls. They are the last people they will release. They do not want to let go of the girls at all. And they don't want to give up so the hard combatants. So when you mm -hmm. come, they will give you the kid who is a from forming the supportive role first before somebody else, you know. Mm -hmm. So there are several things. Now, and of course, be, for, ve for obvious reasons why they don't give up these things. Now let me come to, to, to reintegration. As somebody who has gone through this experience and also somebody who has studied this and who has been involved in the development of policy and all of these things through the United mm -hmm. Nations over the years, I am one who is actually interested in the success of this more than anybody. Therefore, I am as critical as I can be because I know what it is to be there. I know what it is to be removed from it with a lot of hope and be disappointed with what is given to you. Since I came out of the war, the same... Um, um, profiles for opportunity and jobs are the ones that still exist. Uh, there's no market research to really determine what is it that can yield to a, to a better economic opportunity for people coming out of war. Mm -hmm. And this is not to say such uh, career choices as being a mechanic or being a carpenter or being a plumber are not good. But if they can generate income for somebody and, make, and a sustainable way of living, then it's better, right? So when I was coming from where we had the same similar things that were offered to us, mm -hmm. and we were sitting there, some of us, thinking to ourselves, how come nobody's asking us? Former child soldiers are looked upon as being strong, they take, people take their stories, but nobody's interested in engaging them about what practically what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Because I think there's this assumption that maybe because we've been through the war from where we're coming from that we don't have the intelligence to actually think about our situation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I was coming from the way, and this applies, I've seen it over and over, we sit there and people are discussing what should be done for us and we look bored. And if somebody snaps a photo, they will say probably we look traumatized. But we were upset thinking that what is wrong with these people? We are right here. Really? Nobody's asking us what we, we, we need. Yeah. You know, so nothing is being done. For example, let's take an example. Where have you seen very few cases you've seen where people would train a former child soldier to actually assume a position in an NGO or UN mm. organization? Nobody does that. If you do that, that moves this Radical. person, exactly. It makes them know that they can compete at a higher level. But they don't, nobody does. But yet, if you go, for example, to Eastern Congo, the economy is thriving there for UN agencies and NGOs, but not for the people that are being removed and being put back into society. They're being given also. Let's also look at an example when you remove a child and you bring them to their village where that's been ravaged by war, it's been destroyed completely, and then you tell them, go to school here and you're going to do well. They look around, there is nothing. You know? Yeah. So how do you expect them? So oftentimes we give people very little and we expect that they're going to do miracles with it. We give an African boy, a Colombian boy, a primary school education, we expect them, him or her, to be the president of that country. Even in our own country, people with PhDs can't even. Yeah. If somebody running a country with a primary school education is not going to do very well, that's yeah. just that's not uh, gonna, going to work. Now, if you look at the things that are being offered, for example, the agricultural sector is neglected completely. These are places that could create sustainability for some of these countries. Nobody's looking at the agricultural sector. How do you train young people to actually grow their own food so that they're not reliant upon uh, the, the, this, this okay. aid? The emergency phases, of course, is needed. But beyond that, what are the long terms that have been put in place? And two points I will make, two last points. The other one is this. Um, you look at community engagement also. It's not being done fully, because when you remove a child from war, it's not just about the child, it's about the community. Mm. It's being done slowly over and over. When I came from war, 
and people only helping the former child soldiers. The community hated you, they stigmatized mm -hmm. you because they're thinking, next time around, we will join the war too and fight because then we will receive the opportunities after. So you have to involve the community to be part of it so that whatever is happening it involves everybody. And lastly, government. The only way this is going to work is to empower governments to build those structures that have been destroyed before the war, some have continued to decay, mm -hmm. is to build those institutions so that they are, they are able to do this work on their own. Mm -hmm. NGOs, UN agencies should be training governments to do the work that they are doing, as supposed to doing it for them. Because if you don't do that, the reliance is going to continue. Exactly. And then these things can just become cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Central African Republic, the very guys we were negotiating with to come out of the war, who did not know anything, are now in power. One of the warlords is now the Minister of Youth and Sport that I met a number of times. So you tell me what, he, what is he going to do, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't train him. Uh, granted, he's mm -hmm. taking part and there's nothing he can do about this. But if you don't give him the necessary tools yeah. to actually do the work, so we have to empower government. If we don't, we just do it. It's never going to work. We're just going to be chasing our own tail over and over again. I, I, I want to invite people to come to the microphones to ask questions. Um, Three guidelines, state your name and your affiliation, be brief and make sure it's a question. And just, just to kind of piggyback on something Ishmael just said, I think it's critical, it's a critical point you just said that there has to be proper training and transitional leadership from the NGOs to the governments, but it also has to be done with cultural sensitivity. Because I know you've seen it, I've seen it many times where organizations, individuals with the best of intentions will go to a place, usually in Africa, and, and create a response to uh, a post-conflict situation or to the need of former child soldiers that doesn't take into account that community's traditions of healing, reconciliation, forgiveness. You know, it's a, this sort of this Western enforced model of how we, we think former child soldiers should be reintegrated back into the communities. So please feel free to pose questions and again, state your name and affiliation and be brief. First of all, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. My name is Neha Dalal, and I'm asking this question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee. Um, so you talked a lot about misconceptions and misresponses, but what are some things that we as individuals can do to both address these and then also promote reintegration? And in particular, what are some stuff that people have said to you in a conversation that have made you kind of wish that they hadn't said that, and like, what are other ways that we can address those issues? Thank you. This is for Ishmael, or for, for everybody. Okay, for the maybe, entire maybe panel. Maybe the last part for Ishmael. Okay. Who wants to go first? Jocelyn. Um, sure, yeah, I think it's such a wonderful question. And um, I just wanted to hmm, cheat by first talking a little bit about what Ishmael just said and then definitely respond to you. I think one of the things that we were struck by in doing this project with, with communities as a whole is the incredible importance of community and society and family and the concept of individual as kind of a standalone entity is so much less pertinent and interesting in Congo and I think in many ways in a very good-hearted way Western organizations come in and they want to fix a person. Armed groups know how to break ties between communities and families and individuals and we as an international community are not figuring out how to rebuild them. We still have a very individual model of care where we try to fix someone without talking to them about the fact that they're returning to communities which are exhausted mm -hmm. by conflict and asking communities to take in difficult, vulnerable, hurt, traumatized members when they are hurt and traumatized and tired and poor themselves. And I think the entire model of the way that we do reintegration programming has to be much more holistic, not only um, you know, looking at individuals, but families, communities, and also doing this like hard-nosed market research. I don't know why economists, you know, don't really come to conflict zones and do interesting work. I, um, you know, I think so many of the reintegration programs we saw were heroic and amazing. But we also saw people giving out sewing machines in places that had no electricity. We saw ten boys be given one male goat and told to start a goat farm. So I'm not an animal husbandry <laughs> specialist, <laughs> but I assure you, it is very difficult to do that. 
So, you know, I think the kind of responses that we see, and it's the same kind of sometimes tired responses because people are responding to a call for funding. They have to, like, reply tomorrow, and then the funding lasts for three weeks, so they grope for the nearest, easiest thing, and, you know, there's a sewing machine. There's, you know, um, a community field, and instead of doing long-term, thoughtful, holistic funding based on evidence, based on good trauma practices, which are coming out right now from places like uh, you know, Johns Hopkins University did an amazing um, evidence-based look at how mental health services can work in these situations. I mean, I think those are really the ways forward. In terms of um, what individuals can do, I think talking about the issue and engaging on it is so important. And Ishmael, I've heard you speak so eloquently in the past about kind of how individuals can, can speak to this in a, in a thoughtful way. <laughs> so I'm just pun punting <laughs> shamelessly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, since this is a, a place of thinking, my advice to, um, to everybody here is that, first of all, how we do our research, to stop thinking of our research as we have this subject, but then we need to, to think of people as human beings when we do our research, to move from that. And secondly, to really engage people on the ground and listen to what they have to say, not interpret what we think they want to say. Oftentimes, when I was a, for some strange reason, when you're coming for more, every time you say something, somebody will rephrase it to you as if to say, this is what you mean. Like, absolutely not. I meant what I just said, <laughs> you know. So it's to actually listen to what people say because people are, are saying things directly that they need. And also look at the grant. And also stop thinking about this idea that we're going to save people. Nobody's mm. going to save anybody, mm. you know. We have to put certain practical things in place if we're going to solve the problem and stop being emotional about things so much. We need to do a lot of work on the ground. This whole thing, forgiveness. Everybody say, oh, let's forgive each other. Forgiveness is not possible if there are not certain practical things done to make that possible. I forgive you and my village is still burned down. I'm going to chase you when I see you down the street. If my village is being built up, I have something to live for. I have opportunities. I can do things. Then I would forgive. But people often forget. And oftentimes they so what I would say is that when we're doing research and when we're thinking about these issues, to think that the people that have survived these wars are remarkably intelligent because it takes intelligence to survive, to survive. the kind of situations that they have survived. To hold that, to actually think about that before we move forward. That's what I would say, to engage people and work with them. Now, of course, there are things that we can offer because we have certain experiences in how to run certain things and structures and things like that that people don't have. We can build on those things with them. We can give them those skill sets. We can give them the tools that can help them build those skill sets, but stop building things for them and hoping that they would come for it and say, oh, wow, this is really great. I want, because I'll guarantee you, I didn't want to leave war because in the environment that I lived in, my security was better when I had the weapon. When I gave it up, I wasn't sure, really. You understand what I mean? So if you don't create a sense of security and you expect that I'm going to just succumb to the fact that you say you are the UN or you are the international community, it works to some extent. But to some extent, when you're not there at night or when you've gone back to New York, I'm left with a, a lot of interesting people, put it lightly. Mm -hmm. So I need to make sure I believe what is being done. So for me, in short, that's what I would say. We really need to get down to the practical things. And I think we need to start... in. Again, I work for this organization. I think one of the things that need to change with uh, NGOs and UN agencies is that they need to find a lot of people with hard skills. We have a lot of people with soft skills. We need a lot of people with hard skills mm. to be able to actually get some things done. Um, they may fire me, but I don't care. <laughs> thank you. Lila, I'm going to actually go to this side. More questions here? Uh, thank you. My name is Sita Gofard. I'm a junior at the college, and th I mean, thank you so much for bringing up uh, such an important issue um, at this forum, um, one that really needs to be addressed. I wanted to ask you about the process of dealing with and confronting the parties directly responsible for engaging child soldiers in conflicts. You mentioned uh, negotiating with commanders um, or having the UN and, and NGOs um, having to sit down with the warlords. And, and, and try to, you know, try to engage with them. And I wanted to ask you, what is that process like? Uh, is it frustrating? And in particular, what strategies work and what strategies don't work, in your experience, in informing and persuading these parties that children have no place in conflict? Thank you. Let's have Leila take that uh, question. 
Yes, I think that you are asking the, the right question and this is the challenge that we are facing. It's, of course, we cannot do things, fix things without, first of all, fix, getting these people, understanding and accepting that this is not acceptable and you cannot just come and talk and people will say, oh, you are right, I will not do it. And to, 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 to come to this, of course, we have our uh, uh, mandate that give us the leverage. We have a legal framework with the, secu the teeth of the Security Council. So we, we have some legitimacy if we have access to these people. When I was in DRC for four years, I was, of course, in Masisi, in, in Walikali, in uh, Kiwanja, in all these places where I met with these people, and you have to know with whom you are talking. Some, they don't know. You can maybe influence them if you sensitize them. Some, they knew very well that what they are doing is not, is not acceptable, and even it's a, a war crime. So how you can, you have, first of all, to know to map the people with whom you are working, and that's what we are doing ourselves, these are governments. So that's why we decided we have eight governments recruiting children. These are governments. Let us work, push them, put the pressure, use every, every opportunity. I will give you an example. On the, on the list of eight that we have, we have last, the war in, in, in Mali, and we have Chad on the list and they were involved in Mali. We use the fact that the UN have the due diligence policy to not accept those who have uh, 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 um, uh, criminal background or human rights violation to push the Chadian government to finalize the action plan and to be delisted. And we are really in a process of finalizing it and they are they are implementing the roadmap that we put together. I, vis I went there, I met with the president when he came here, also I did. So these are governments. They are accessible. Some have an interest to clean their, their image. Other would like to get to access funds. You know, for example, mm. uh, the, the list the, that some governments say we don't support an army that have child in, right. in, their, in, their, in their ranks. The UN do the same. We have a due diligence policy. We cannot support. Uh, uh, so these are the tools with government. And then you have the accountability. This is also l'épée, the democracy. You say, if we can work together, we can clean things. But if you don't, we have also other tools. Of course, you have ICC, but ICC cannot deal with everything. It's just to complement. We need to ensure that in the country, you have such a response. And then, as you said for the reintegration, it's also a challenging situation because you have to build institutions and you have also to change the mindset and you have to ensure that, that the penal chain from the, uh, the, joint, the, the investigation, from the prosecution, the trial, and ensure those who are tried, they stay in prison because we can open doors after the trial and they return to, to, to the bush. So all this is complicated, but if you have the leverage, if you have, as you said, the, the, the understanding of how you address, then you have the armed groups. And the armed groups is another story. Because the, it's not, you cannot say this is homogeneous group, we will work with them, we will have a strategy for them. This you need to know who you can have leverage who you can influence, either because they have an interest in, in political process in the future. That's what happened, for example, with the FSA. The FSA, they are listed for recruitment of children in Syria. They are, they would like to clean their image so we can engage with them. It's the same with the, uh, with the MNLA in, in, in uh, North uh, Mali because they would like to engage with the, with the government. There, some, it's very hard. So you have to find also the way to arrest people, to put a place. So it's, it's, it's that the way that we work. We also work with member states. Because if you can 
you are backed by the P5, if you are backed by the Security Council, if member states in their bilateral cooperation, they also support the fact that they don't want to maintain the fact that children are still recruited. So you need to work according to what is, what is at your hand and try to push the agenda. We are doing it. It's not easy because we, at the end, it's member state who decide. And in a country, it's the government who decide. So if you don't get the government on board, by a way or another, you will not achieve the result. So that's what we are trying to do. That's how we push the agenda. And we have our failure. We have the challenge. We know that we are, we are touching. We, we, we cannot even say how many still are in the bush. We knew what we, how many we can release, but we cannot. And, and as you said, or both, you, we, we are talking about, about the reintegration. And we talk about the stigmatization. But we forgot the re-recruitment. You know that children that already were soldiers, they are the first to be re-recruited. When we have the, the M23 after the rebellion, they went to bring those who were in Central African Republic. Seleka did the same. They went to the center where the children are, and they, because they already knew it's easy. They don't need to train them again. So they are the first. So we have to, first of all, to ensure before reintegrating children or reunifying with their community, we have to ensure that we will not expose them to re-recruitment, to stigmatization. So all these are challenges. And I think you said what we can do. You can do a lot. Because when, for example, the university work on this, and try to see where are the gaps, how we can fill them. This is not nothing, because that's the kind of things that are lacking. What he was talking about, what he experienced, I myself experienced it. I think, may I give this example or we stop? Well, I, well, I think we, you know, I want to pause there, and maybe we have, we have a few more moments left for questions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. We'll, let's, let's do this. Let's go to this gentleman here. Ooh. State your st state your question and your affiliation. Keep it brief. We'll come back to you and we'll ask two questions at the same time. And I have one member of the panel answer each question. Yeah. Hi. Okay. My name is Abdulaziz Said. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Education. So Ishmael, uh, likewise, I'm a big fan of hip hop. And so, what rap song did you find very ca cathartic or very therapeutic for your recovery? And second, in 2009, uh, Sri Lanka signed a peace treaty what lessons from Sri Lanka are being used for the rehabilitation of child soldiers in Sri Lanka? Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is about the role of juvenile justice and punishment and people who claim that punishment is an important part of rehabilitation. Um, that's my question. Okay, let's do one more. Hi, thank you all so much. My name's Emma, I work at Pathfinder International. We're a sexual and reproductive health organization. And my question is actually for Jocelyn. You had mentioned that one of the defining issues that child soldiers face is mental health issues. But in a lot of the countries where there are child soldiers, there aren't really definitions for a lot of the diseases and illnesses that a lot of these child soldiers actually experience. So I'm wondering how organizations can address that. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with that last question for Jocelyn, and then we'll backtrack to the questions for Ishmael. I think, I think your question was probably best directed towards Layla. <laughs> much for that question. I think it's a defining issue. Um, as we heard from the communities, regaining kind of a sense of purpose and a role in the community gave you this dignity and agency. And the truth is that jobs and income generating training can be a really effective mental health intervention, as are building ties with um, a social network. And um, while you know the systems are very different in some ways, there are really incredible interventions that can be done in low resource settings where you don't have a lot of trained psychologists or even trained care providers of any sort. Um, you know, people are looking into cognitive narrative therapy as a way that has been actually now um, in kind of a randomized trial been proven with very successful with survivors of sexual violence in DRC. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity to try this kind of therapy with former child soldiers as well. 
Um, I think we need to recognize the gender differences and experiences. So right now, all programming is kind of geared towards the concept that former combatants are boys, and I think we need to understand both boys and girls' experiences in armed groups. Um, and I mean, I think there are ways to do thoughtful, long-term programming that aren't, you know, completely um, innovative even. You know, I think we have some really good best practices, and I think through talking to communities and remembering that we need to heal both individuals but also their networks, that's probably um, the most effective way forward. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, Ishmael, I think I'm, I'm going to ask Ishmael just to answer the, the first half of that question about hip-hop, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, it was a very short answer. Um, uh, during my rehabilitation period, music played a very strong role because it connected me to uh, the times that things were peaceful in my country, and particularly Bob Marley. So that was something that I listened to, and a few other old-school hip-hop music, the ones that didn't talk about having many girls in the rim of their cars, not that type. <laughs> the ones that had more poetry and other things like that. So it was, uh, that was, yeah, I would say that. Thank you, thank you. And Leila, the, the, this young woman's question yeah, about I justice. Think, uh, he asked about the, the uh, Sri Lanka. Yeah, no? we're, gonna, we're gonna skip that. And maybe afterwards, you can talk, talk about Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, with regard to justice, uh, what we say, at, at least the, the, our position in, uh, in my mandate, our position is to say, first of all, we would like that children that are associated with armed forces or armed group not be considered primarily as criminal, but as victim, primarily as victim. Because they generally have been forced, and even those who went voluntarily, they also were brainwashed so because they are in the, in the community. And so we, we, we consider that it's important to consider them. But of course, if they, they themselves committed a crime. So it's important also the accountability. Because, without a, because the child is not at, at 15, at 17, if you, even if you are not a child soldier, if you commit a crime in the community, you, you will face justice not the same level of punishment and not the same justice as the adult, but you will face responsibility because of that. So it's important that if we have a, a, a situation of uh, 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 children that committed violence, to ensure what we ask government. One is they will be uh, addressed to juvenile justice, not the adult justice make sure that the fair trial principle are respected and the, the, the tools needed are put in place. Third, it's we privilege when the responsibility is that is restorative justice rather than punitive. That's what we try to propose to government. When I was in DRC, for example, working on fighting impunity, assisting the justice system, because we tried to address the impunity by building the penal chain. With the support of the UN, having joined the investigation team, we put in place the, 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 the prosecution support cell, the mobile court to allow the court to go to the area where the crimes, remote area committed, and also to monitor the detention to ensure that those who are detained will not be ill-treated. At the same time, our, our engagement with the government, if, if children are arrested, they, should, they would not be dealt with by the military justice, but sent to the juvenile justice. So that's how we try to uh, influence. One, prima, primarily victim, if not uh, uh, justice, mil, ju juvenile justice, and at the end, restorative rather than punitive. Any more time? No. Oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, sir, ma'am. Um, one last plug. I'm okay. Sh I'm sorry. Last I'm plug. shameless. Um, I just want to let you guys know that there's um, body maps up around the forum right now, and I encourage you to go take a look at them. And one last note about 
the process of participatory research is that we have created a mobile museum or kind of a roving exhibit of these images that we've taken back to all of the communities that were our collaborators in this project. So they can see not only what they have created, but what all these other communities in DRC have created as well, and what they've been through. And there was this kind of remarkable discovery process that was part of that. We're documenting it, and we're putting it on the website, but as you guys visit these images, these are the same images that have wended their way through truly the middle of nowhere in Congo. And we have some remarkable partners that have been part of the process in the front row. So as you look at this exhibit, it's very much part of an ongoing process that is occurring in Congo as well. And if you'd like to continue to talk, I think many of us will stay behind after the event to answer questions. Um, there will be opportunity after, afterwards to come up and talk to the panelists if you want to have a more intimate conversation or raise questions. We have to stop, stop there. Uh, but first, I want to want to thank uh, Carrie Devine, the director of the John F. Kennedy Forum, uh, her colleague Beth Macklin, and the rest of the team for producing this the event this evening. Thank you for coming out, and good night.